going to be looking at chapters 5 and 6, and the title is The Conquest of Jericho. Let's go back to Joshua chapter 1, though, for a little bit of reminder. Remember that Joshua and the people of God are perhaps waiting for Moses to come down from Mount Nebo. And yet the next thing they hear is that God says, Moses, my servant, is dead. And he tells Joshua that he is the chosen one to lead God's people into the promised land. And then he gives this promise and this vision. Verse 3. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. What a great promise to the new leader. Of course, we realize right here that Joshua is 103 years old. I know that encouraged many of us last week. That God can still use us as we age a little bit right there. I know uh, Nick Fortieri was particularly encouraged by that study. But right here is an incredible promise. Every place where you set your foot, I'm going to give you that territory. That's the vision that God held on out. He says, listen, as I was with Moses, so I'm going with you. No one is going to be able to stop you. So be strong and courageous. Be strong and vigorous. Let nothing stop you from accomplishing the task that I'm giving you. Go to Joshua chapter 4. We find right after they'd crossed the Jordan River, we read in verse 20, And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones they'd taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you'd crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just what he'd done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we'd crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. I mean, right here we have Joshua reminding the people to have vision. And you know, the Bible says, without vision, the people perish. And we've got to really ask ourselves, if we are going to be about the conquest of the promised land, if we are going to be about the conquest of evangelizing the world, do we have a vision to do it? Are you with me right here? See, that's our first point, is a vision for victory. A vision for victory. You know, it's interesting right here that in the crossing of the Jordan, Joshua said that God did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know the hand of the Lord is powerful. I mean, that's quite a statement right there. In that one act of God, all the people of the world would know about God. That doesn't say they became believers, that they converted on over, but they knew about God. In that sense, the world was evangelized in that day. Are you with me right here? And so we know it can be evangelized in our day. Amen? Now, you know, we've got a task. Last week was our first official service of the City of Angels International Christian Church. And the Lord blessed us in an amazing way. And we're very thrilled that so many have come back today. And so we have a task. We're, we want to take the promised land. We want to evangelize the entire city of Los Angeles. Now, from a human point of view, that might seem impossible, but with God, nothing is possible. Are you with me right here? Because every place we set our foot, God is going to give us that territory. Now, we have some that have an extra special measure of faith. I, I've got to hold up Luis Martinez right here. Uh, Luis, I mean, he, he loves Whittier. This is where he lives. This is where he's raising his family. And, uh, you know, Luis says, man, I want to get a lot of people out to the service. And so he was trying to be creative. And so he went to a local Starbucks, and he gave the Starbucks person $300 and said, listen, 
Every person that buys coffee this morning, you send them on over to me and tell them they just had a free cup of coffee. Now, I don't want to buy anything else for them. None of this mocha, chocolate, cappuccino stuff that costs, you know, $20 for one cup. But just a cup of coffee. He says, you tell them that gentleman over there is the one that bought that coffee. He wants to talk to him about something. And so the lady did that. So free coffee was given, and just a stream of people started coming over to Luis. He says, man, thank you, man, but uh, what is this all about? He says, I got to tell you about my church. I got to tell you about my God. You see, he believes that Whittier, all of Whittier can hear about Jesus Christ. Are you with me right here, guys? You know, I got to hold up another brother of great faith, and that's uh, DJ Thomasford right here. You know, DJ lives in Hollywood. And, uh, of course, he's married to a very talented wife, uh, Casey. That's not to say DJ isn't equally talented. But, uh, you know, they've, they've been in bands together growing on up. And so the Lord really put upon their hearts to have kind of an AMF ministry, a Hollywood ministry. They live in Hollywood. The little group they live is there. And, and one of the things that we want to do is to reach out to all the young people that are moving to Hollywood, California, every day just to make it in the business. I mean, shocking as it seems, every day, 300 young people move in to Los Angeles to make it in the business, whether it be in singing and acting or in some part of it. And so many of their dreams are dashed. But DJ and Casey are saying, hey, there's something greater than your personal dream. It's a dream to have a relationship with God. And so, you know, I've been saying, DJ, you've got to get something that will draw these people in. We need to have on Friday nights, every Friday night, kind of an open mic night where we can invite our non-Christian friends out and just to see that Christians have a little talent, amen, and have a lot of fun at the same time. And uh, so he says, you know, I've been trying to go after it. I said, bro, you just got to pray hard and you got to go after it. And finally, last week, he says, bro... It's awesome. I found a lady that's open to us having an open mic night on Friday night. I said, that's awesome. He says, brother, how much are we willing to pay for it? I go, mm, bro, the finances are tight. I said, how about 250 He goes, well, I was thinking 200 Well, I, I, I like that better, but bro, we're desperate. We've got to find a place. He says, yeah, and it's right on Hollywood Boulevard. I said, okay, okay, I, I'll authorize up to $400 every Friday night. I mean, we need this desperately. So they go on in, they talk to the lady, and, and, and they, they, they talk, and say, oh yeah, this is what we want to do, this is what we want to do, and, and incredibly, she says, well, she says, DJ, I've just got one more thing to talk about, and DJ's saying, it's the money, it's the money, I know it is. She says, DJ, how much do I have to pay you and Casey to come here? Now, I hope DJ didn't take too long in his answer. He says, we're going to do it for free. And, you know, that's a good marriage, you know, when both people feel like they got a deal. You know what I'm talking about? But that's, that's a whole other sermon. But amen. The bottom line is we got this place on Hollywood Boulevard for free every Friday night to preach about Jesus Christ. That fire you on up right there. You see, every place we set our foot, God is going to give us. Are you with me here, church? Turn to Hebrews chapter 5. In Hebrews 5, the writer talks about what it means to be mature. He says in verse 11, We have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you're slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. I have a vision that every member of the City of Angels Church at some time becomes mature in Christ. You say, well, I'm fired up about that. Well, what's it mean according to the Scripture to be mature in Christ? Is that you become a teacher. Or perhaps in our Bible talk language, a Bible talk leader. So that every place we live, we have a Bible talk. We got a Bible talk, yes, in Whittier. Yeah, we want Hollywood. We need a lot in Hollywood. Amen, guys? But we got one in Marina del Rey. We got one in Buena Park. We need one in Irvine. We need one over there in Antelope Valley. I mean, every place we set our foot, we've got to have a disciple who says, listen, I want to become mature. 
And to be mature is to be a teacher. Some people go, you know, I didn't sign up for that. Listen, the moment you said, I'm going to make Jesus Lord, you're saying you're following after Jesus. Amen? And my understanding from the Bible is that Jesus was a teacher, that Jesus was a leader. So you've already signed up to be a leader and teacher. It's just a question of how long it takes to get there. Are you with me there? But as a church, we need to have a great vision of literally not just hundreds, but thousands of Bible talks throughout Los Angeles. Does that fire you on up? You see, our promised land is this city, and we need vision for victory. Now let's get into chapter 5. Chapter 5 of the book of Joshua. Verse 1. Now when all the Ammonite kings west of the Jordan, all the Canaanite kings along the coast, heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we'd crossed over, their hearts melted, and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeah Parla. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about the desert 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. But the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised to their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place. And these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. Well, right here, we find that God's enemies are fearful of God's people. That, that God's miracles were going, Wow, you have an awesome job. But very interestingly, before the first big battle of Jericho, and Jericho was one of the most powerful fortified cities in all of Canaan. God says, we need a time out right here. We need to be spiritually ready to take this city. And so our second point is simply restoration through repentance. The Bible says right here that God says, hey, the Israelites that came out of Egypt and through the Red Sea, those people were disobedient the first time they came to the Promised Land. We studied that last week. And all of the fighting men, and in the Bible, in the book of Numbers, fighting men are 20 years older and up. All of those men, because they lacked faith, died in the desert. Now, during that sojourn in the desert, about 38 years after the first coming to the Promised Land, nobody was circumcised. And so you literally have a whole generation and a lot of your army uncircumcised. Now, part of the army is circumcised because if a kid was 19, 18, or 12, he would have been circumcised then in Egypt. Are you with me right here? And so there were some men in the group that were circumcised. A lot of people kind of say, well, how important really is circumcision in the Old Testament? Well, we find in Exodus chapter 4, verse 24, that God was about to kill Moses because Moses had not circumcised his son. I would say that's pretty serious. What do you think? You know, it is interesting that uh, the Bible says right here that at that time the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. Now, at this time, the predominant uh, metal used in weaponry was iron. And iron was used because it was more durable than stone, in this case, particularly flint. But most likely, God says, listen, I don't want a man-made element to circumcise my people. I want something I've made. And it's only be a one-time thing. And so make flint knives to circumcise the men. And of course, we understand that circumcision is simply the removal of foreskin from the male organ. Now, it's interesting right here. It says, so Joshua made the flint knives, verse 3, and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeah Paralot. And that literally means hill of foreskins. And so you, you, you have literally thousands upon thousands of foreskins heaped up 
Now, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is a very important concept right here. All of these men are going through, let's just put it this way, a lot of pain. But they're going through it together and making the same covenant decision to God. And so here they are, they're lumping all the foreskins together, and most likely then they would burn them. And they're all saying, listen, this is the decision we are individually and now collectively making. We are making a covenant relationship with God to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so the Bible simply says that they stayed there until they were healed. And then in verse 9, the Lord said to Joshua, today I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So that place was called Gilgal to this day. Well, what does that mean? Well, most likely this. In Egypt, the Israelites were slaves. You say, but yeah, but when they went through the Red Sea, weren't they free? Well, they were free, but they didn't have their own land. They weren't a nation yet because, in, of course, their mind, they needed physical land. That's why every place you set your foot becomes their nation. Well, now, they don't have a very big nation yet, but they have walked a few steps there in the Promised Land. Are you with me right here, guys? And so now they have become the nation that God had promised them to be. And so they have rolled away the reproach of slavery. And now they're a powerful nation of God's people, all dedicated to God. Does that fire you one up right there? Now, for a lot of individuals, circumcision eludes them as far as the importance in the Old Testament sense. But it's also talked about in the New Testament. Turn to the book of Colossians. In Colossians, Paul's talking to the whole church there. And he he says in verse 9 of chapter 2, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given a fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the written code with the regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it on the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Does that fire you went up there? Right here, the Bible says, and Paul specifically writes, he says, you need to understand what true baptism is all about. Now, we live in a time where many different groups teach many different things about baptism. And we've got to get a conviction that however we were raised, whatever tradition we come from, We're just simply going to get out the Bible and decide what does the Bible teach on any particular subject. Are you with me right here? And if it matches what we believe, amen. But if it doesn't match what we believe, we've got to change our convictions and go by the Bible. That's what it means to follow God. And that's why studying the Bible is so exciting because sometimes you you run across things that you didn't know. For instance, myself, I was fairly religious when I came to a, a, a group very similar to this. A group of people that wanted to be totally committed to the Lord. And at first I came and I was really drawn by the singing and the excitement and the relationships. And I thought, man, everybody's really committed. And I started looking at their lives and I said, wow, they're totally consistent with what they're preaching. I said, that's a church I want to join. Well, there were two problems right here. My life and my doctrine. I mean, I, I... was in a fraternity, I was drinking, I was messing around with women. I mean, my life was a long way from being a Christian, so I went to church every Sunday. On the other hand, I had been taught in the church that I grew on up in that all you had to do to be a Christian was pray Jesus into your heart. And like other people, I mean, I tried to pray Jesus into my heart several times. He kind of came and went, came and went. (laughs) But we need to understand what the Bible teaches right here. Baptism is a very serious thing. Now, some are raised in a tradition where baptism is done as a little baby, paralleling it to the circumcision of the Old Testament. The difference is, as we look right here in verse 12, it says, 
having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God. You see, New Testament baptism requires a personal faith in God that says, God, I want to make a wholehearted commitment to you. I want to give you my heart, soul, mind, and strength for the rest of my life. I want to make Jesus Lord. And so then you are baptized, you are immersed, and you die to the old self. And when you come out of that water, you are born again. Now, today we're very excited because Estella is going to be baptized today. Is that awesome? And so, when she goes down into the water, the old Estella is going to die. All of her sins are going to be washed away. The blood of Jesus is going to contact my face. And so, when she comes out of the water, all of her sins are gone, and she's going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Is that awesome? And the Bible teaches right here that then God will have circumcised the flesh, circumcised her old life, and it's no longer the old Estella that's living, but the new Estella. And this is a covenant relationship. So circumcision in the Old Testament was a matter of life and death. Check it out. And so it is with New Testament baptism. Let's get back to our text in Joshua chapter 5. In Joshua 5. In Joshua 5, we read after everybody has been circumcised. In verse 10. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. Wow. Imagine. Here they, they cross through the Jordan. They erect the stones of remembrance. Joshua says, now it's time for all of us to get right with God. It's time to be circumcised and cement that covenant relationship with them. The moment they're healed, the Bible says right here, they were so excited because they all had a personal relationship with God. They hold the celebration. Well, it was just the timing of the Passover, the most important celebration amongst the Jews when the the death angel passed over all of the Israelite houses because of the blood of the lamb on the doorpost but killed the firstborn in Egypt, which eventually put the pressure on Pharaoh to let, of course, God's people go. Now, here's the thing. This Passover had not been celebrated for literally years. The last time it's recorded in the Old Testament it was celebrated was Numbers chapter 9. That's how far the drift came. You see, the Israelites made a very concrete decision when they didn't enter the promised land. They lost faith, and when they lost faith, I think, even their religious activities began to lose meaning. And their religious activities lost so much meaning, they just stopped doing them all together. But now we find everybody going, hold it. I got circumcised. I got circumcised. Yeah, I got circumcised. Yeah, I got circumcised. <laughs> and we held that crank and bonfire. But we're talking, the number of fighting men in Israel when they came out of Egypt was about 600,000. And it says that they're replaced at this point. So we know all of these men now have been circumcised, and they all now have a covenant relationship with God. Can you imagine 600,000 guys coming together and saying, man, we've all made the same decision. Now let's celebrate the Passover about how God delivered us. And then the next thing you know, that was the very last day they ate manna because now they began to eat of the land of milk and honey. They, they were finally being rewarded by God, the promise that they were now receiving by faith. Is that cranking or not? See, restoration through repentance. I thought what Paul I had to share today was incredible, church. You know, it takes a lot of guts to get up here and say, listen, I'm lukewarm. I've fallen away from God, but I want to get back with the Lord. And you know, there, there's so many people out there that are just like Paul I. They're going to church, they're doing religious activities, but they're lukewarm and they don't even know it. See, when you're on fire for God, you know it. And there's a radicalness to it. 
And I think we need to have a conviction as a church that we're not just trying to bring in a membership, you know, en masse, but just like the Israelites do, one by one they were circumcised, one by one we need to bring people in by baptism, one by one we need to bring people in by restoration, one by one we need to bring people in by placing membership, and so we have a congregation where everybody has a cranking relationship with God. Can you imagine the joy in the congregation? Are you with me right here? You know, this past week, I've had to lay it out in some of my studies with people about the repentance they needed to have. One person I was studying with had stolen from his boss on a couple of occasions in different jobs. And I told this person, I said, well, what do you think is repentance? And he says, well, I'm just never going to do that again. I go, no. I think you've got to go back to the boss and you've got to be willing to pay back what you stole. Well, where does it say that in the Bible? I said, listen, that's repentance. That's a change of heart. In another situation, I talked to a person. He was living with his girlfriend. I said, listen, you've got to come out of that unholy relationship if you're going to worship a holy God. See, guys, we need to understand that we've got to have the guts and the convictions to call people to live by the Bible. Yes, the decisions are hard. Yes, the decisions are painful. Maybe not quite as much as circumcision, but it's painful. But then that produces that refreshment. Are you with me right here? And that's how the Israelites were feeling. Restoration through repentance. Let's read on now, verse 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemy? Neither, he replied. But as the commander of the army of the Lord, I've now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place that you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Our third point, if we're going to take the promised land, is that our highest motive brings holiness. Right here, and I think this is a particularly powerful point for those of us that are wanting to be leaders in God's kingdom, is that we have got to be purely motivated by leading God's people. You know, right here we find that Joshua was probably alone. He's probably on some mountains trying to overlook the city of Jericho, scouting it on out. And the Bible says all of a sudden he looks up and he says, there's a man with a drawn sword in his hand. And of course he's thinking, man, I don't recognize this guy. And he goes, he says, are you for us or for our enemy? And then he comes back with an unusual point, neither. And I, you can kind of picture like Josh went, what? You're not for us and you're not for our enemy. What the heck are you doing here? He goes, but as the commander of the Lord's army, I've now come. Wow. It was the angel of God. He falls face down. He says, what message does my Lord have for his servant? You know, it's interesting these days how in some ways we make light of the phrase, God is on our side. I mean, in the sports world, everybody is praying for God to be on their side. I mean, we got Red Sox plan fans saying, oh, God, be on our side. And then... And then we got the Yankee fans, oh God, be on our side. Said, hold it, hold it. We got two brothers in Christ believing that God is on their side. That's ludicrous. But you know, sometimes even in the midst of what's going on in our, in, in our fellowship, in our former fellowship, this is a very appropriate scripture. We always want to say, oh, my action is right because God is on my side. But God wanted to teach Joshua. He says, no, 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 no. You got it backwards. It's not a matter of me being on your side. Joshua, you need to choose to be on my side. See, that's what a leader has to do. That's the highest motivation. And see, what a lot of people wrestle with in becoming a Christian or in choosing a church, they say, okay, which people do I like the most? You know, I like this group a whole bunch. They may be lukewarm, they're uncommitted, but I like these people. That's not the way that you follow God. Before you can decide who is right, you've got to decide what is right. 
When you decide what is right, then you need to make a decision who is right. You don't look at the numbers. You don't look at anything on else. But what are their convictions and what is their life all about? Are you with me right here? Students, this is absolutely important. You know, some, in our fellowship, a lot of people say, oh, the ICOC is over here. The Portland church is over there. I think that's a total misrepresentation of what, what we're really all about. We're not on the Portland side. We're on God's side. We're on God's side. We've made a decision. We're going to go by the Word of God, and we're holding every single member to go by the Word of God. Now, obviously, we all mess up, and we need a lot of grace and mercy. Are you with me right here, guys? But this isn't about being on a human side or having a human leader. This is all about being on God's side. And when you decide what is right, then you can decide who is right. So, for example, if you believe you're supposed to evangelize the world in a generation, you say, okay, I've got to find a group of people that believe that you can evangelize the world in a generation. If you believe you've got to be baptized and you've got to be a sold-out disciple in order to be saved, then you look for the people that believe you've got to be baptized and a sold-out disciple to be saved, and so on down the line. Are you with me right here? You don't look at human relationships first because human relationships will cause you to be sentimental and will make decisions that will be contrary to what God wants you to do. And so right here, God purifies Joshua. He says, listen, it's not a matter, am I on your side? The question is, are you on my side? And see, that's where the song comes from. Whose side are you fighting on? We're fighting on the Lord's side. The funniest thing, a lot of people love that song. They don't even know it's from Scripture. <laughs> and that's what the song's about. We are on God's side. How do you know if it's God's side? You've got to get the Scriptures out. You don't worry about who is right until you've determined what is right, and then you can make your decisions. Amen? Now, very interestingly, because of the way that the Bible's divided right here in chapter 6, a lot of people just simply think that the message that uh, Joshua asked for in verse 14 is simply, take off your sandals for the place you're standing is holy. Well, that was part of the message. But the actual message goes on down right here. There's a little note that says in verse 1, Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. So that's the setting. And now there's going to be a message. Let's just hold for a second. We need to understand that when God called the Israelites to conquer the promised land, the first city they had to conquer was going to be Jericho. Now Jericho was a cranking city fortress of a city. It was set on a mound, or in Israel they're called Tel. And in many places around the world, you always set up a city, or you set up a fort on a hill, because it gives you the most advantage in a battle. Secondly, it had two walls around it. Not one, but two. From excavations, they found that there was a retaining wall of about 15 feet at the base of this hill. On top of the retaining wall is built the first wall. The retaining wall is about 15 feet. The first wall is about 5 or 6 feet. Then there's a little space, and then there's the second wall of 25 feet. Now, if you're an Israelite back in 1400 B.C., and you're looking at a 45-foot wall, you go, that's a cranking wall. Now, a ploy used for thousands of years to try to conquer cities was called a siege. Well, we know that Jericho could have lasted literally years. There was a freshwater spring inside of Jericho. And we know from Joshua chapter 3, verse 15, when they crossed the Jordan, it was at harvest time. Remember? Because it was the high water mark. So we know they've already brought the harvest on in. So, I mean, they're ready for a long time. Siege. Are you with me right here? And so basically, if you're an Israelite, you're going, wow, 45 feet of wall, double wall. What are we going to do? These people can outlast us. And so that's why it says Jericho was tightly shut up. No one went in and no one went out. Now do you understand the scripture there? Okay, now here comes the message of the angel of God to Joshua. Remember, he's now taken off his shoes. He's on holy ground right there. 
And God gives Joshua the battle plan to take out this seemingly impregnable fortress. Verse 2. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I've delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up, every man straight in. The angel goes, Joshua, we have a cranking plan. It's simple. All you got to do is you get the ark of God right in the front. You get seven priests with seven horns cranking those horns. And here's what I want you to do. It's going to take seven days. It's going to take seven days. But what we're going to do is on the first day, you'll start out, the ark will go, the priests with the horns will blow it, and they'll just go around the city. Now, you remember, he's talking thousands and thousands of people. So basically, they're going to make a giant circle around the city as they walk around the city. He says, after you're done, call it a day. Do it the second time. Do it the third, fourth, fifth, sixth. But on the seventh day, go around seven times. And on the seventh day, let the trumpet sound, let the people shout, and then go straight in. Sounds like a great plan. Well, let's read what happened. Verse 6. So Joshua sent them on, called the priests, and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the seven priests carrying trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the people, Advance, march around the city with the armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets. And the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets. And the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua had commanded the people, Do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling at once. Then the people returned to the camp and spent the night there. Right now, it brings us to our fourth and final point. A unified faith to faithfully wait and not deviate. A unified faith to faithfully wait and not deviate. Remember, they had a unified vision. You are going to take the promised land. Every place where you set your foot, I will give you. Nobody will be able to stop you. They all had that vision. They had a unified restoration. They were all circumcised. They were ready to go. They had endured the pain. Now they were ready for the game. There was a unified celebration of the Passover feast. They were fired up about what God had done in the past. But now they were fired up about what God was doing in the present. And then there was the unified call. I'm not on your side, but you guys be on my side. He says, now that you're totally unified, and that's true unity, when we're unified in the Lord. Amen, guys? Now you're ready to attack the city. And so, can you imagine the trumpets? Now, it wasn't by chance God goes, mm, let's pick seven trumpets, mm, seven priests, seven days. That was a sign, because the number seven, both Old Testament and New, means completeness, totalness. What God was signaling was, this is going to be a total, complete victory. And so the first day, nobody said anything. Can you imagine thousands and thousands of people saying nothing? Have you ever been in an elevator? It's the most uncomfortable thing. You sit in there and you don't really feel like talking. Can you imagine thousands and thousands of people in like a galactic giant elevator and nobody's saying anything? It's like ominous. And all you hear are these trumpets. And so the people of the city look down. And they see the guys with the trumpets sounding the trumpets. They see the ark of God and they've heard about this ark of God. And they see the people of Israel. Like I said, it wasn't just a little line of folks right here. The number in Israel was so large that it basically circled them. And 
there was utter silence except for the trumpet. And then they came back to sleep. Can you imagine being in the city of Jericho that night? The same thing happened the next day and the next day. On the seventh day, we read in verse 16. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the people, Shout! For the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies, we said. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Verse 20. When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle and sheep and donkeys. Wow. We see right here that at the seventh time around, There was the sounding of the trumpet, the people shouted, and then the Bible says, the wall collapsed. And they were able to obey, the scripture says, and so they went straight in. That's very interesting. I did a little little research on Jericho. And the Lord had allowed Elena and myself to visit Jericho. And it is on a mount, and it is utterly decimated. But very interestingly, when the archaeologists got there, they confirmed what was said. The earliest excavations took place in the early 1900s. And remember we talked about there was a retaining wall, and then on top of the retaining wall was the first wall. Retaining wall, 15 feet. The first wall, 5 feet. Space and then a wall 25 feet. Most invasions into a fortified city always collapse the wall in. I mean, remember Lord of the Rings and all that. Amen. Okay. Because you want to break down the wall. So collapsing walls of conquering people would break it down, and you would break down the wall in a weak point. But the archaeologists found that this didn't happen. What had happened was the walls collapsed out. Now, when the top wall collapsed out, can you imagine the whole outer wall collapsing out? All the stones fall, and what is created? A ramp. The second wall collapses down, and what's created? A second ramp. So instead of being able to invade a city at just one point of weakness, no, 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 the scriptures were fulfilled. The Israelites had circled around the whole city of Jericho, and what they did, the first wall collapses, there's a ramp. Second wall collapses, there's a ramp. And so literally everybody goes straight in from any point on the compass. Is that cranking or not? You see, this really happened. Now here's an exciting, exciting part. Verse 22. Joshua said to the two young men who spied out the land, Go into the prostitute's house and bring her out, all who belong to her, in accordance with the oath of her. So the young men who had done the spying went into and brought out Rahab, her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. They brought her out the entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it. But they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho and she lives among the Israelites to this day. So we know that this book was written during her lifetime. See, Rahab's still living. She's still with us. Now here's the amazing thing that archaeology found. In the first excavation, they looked at the west wall. And the west wall was indeed collapsed, ramp, second wall, collapsed, ramp. Then they looked at the south, they looked at the east, and east was the same. But then they came to the north. 
And in the excavation of the north wall, there was a small section of the outer north wall that had not collapsed. What did it say that Rahab lived? Her house was right on top of the wall. And when the men escaped from her place, they went down to the window and went into the Judean wilderness. Well, now, guess which side of Jericho would be the best place to get into the Judean wilderness? The north side. And so archaeology testifies that God miraculously tore down all the walls so the Israelites could go straight in, but he remembered Rahab because of her faith. Is that awesome or not? Now, you know, There's a lot to be learned from this. A lot of people would have been quick to say, well, why don't we get the victory right now? See, sometimes we need to wait patiently upon the Lord. We want something so badly. And yet Joshua and his army believed so much in God. They were so dedicated, they were willing to take a whole day and walk around the wall. And you know they were praying. What else are you going to do? Another day, another day, another day. And we get all, you know, if somebody, if God doesn't answer our prayers that day, so where's God, where's God? And we lose our faith. But we've got to have a unified faith and faithfully wait and do not deviate. They totally obeyed the Lord. Now, let me tell you something. Can you imagine? Even Joshua, the man of God, 103. I mean, he's been through the Red Sea and he's been through the Jordan. And he has this cranking battle plan, but on the seventh day, the trumpet will sound. He says, now the men got to go straight in. And then all of a sudden, he says, shout! Everybody shout! And then the walls start to crumble outward. The second wall starts to crumble outward. And he goes, charge! I mean, it would have been incredible to see all the Israelites flood into the camp. Just like that. And then he told the guys that were the spies. Make sure you get Rahab. Make sure you get that family. And they said, oh, wow, the water is barely on the north side over there. And they brought her on out, and she was saved. Now, tradition holds it that one of the spies was named Solomon. It's a tradition. It's not in the Bible. But what is in the Bible is that Rahab married Solomon. They have a kid named Boaz, who marries Ruth, whose great-grandson is, of course, King David. Think about this. Who would have ever thought that Rahab, the prostitute, would be a celebrated mother and grandmother of not just David, but Jesus? I mean, think about this. Think about the people that have had just the most profound effect on your life. And one of them's got to be your mom. You know, I'm 52. I'm bumping up against 53. But I'm holding a 52 for now. But even as I was coming in, you know, I, I tell my mom, I said, Mom, you know, and I was trying to be all happy. And then, then I started getting emotional. I'm 52, and I get emotional about my mom because of the sacrifices and the kind of woman that she was. I didn't get to talk to Pat Gimple, my my spiritual mom, but again, I I wanted to let her know I, I thank her. But isn't it amazing that Rahab, a prostitute, and most people would consider that just about as far out as you could get. Not only does God miraculously save her, but then he has a special plan for her to be a mom that blessed not only the Israelites, but all of the nations on earth. Wow. You know, there are many blessings, not the least of which is to have a unified faith in the church. 
You know, one of the things that uh, we believe very deeply here is the individual call to be a sold-out disciple, as we talked about, by baptism, restoration, and place of membership. And so as a church, we need to get a conviction. What made this so powerful about what the Israelites did? Well, they all acted in one heart. You know, the interesting thing, for a lot of people, coming to all the services is a challenge. And yet the Bible says, Matthew 6, 33, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given you as well. Now, a lot of people say, you know, I don't know if I can make Bible talk. I don't know if I can make Wednesday night. I don't know if I can make every Sunday. Well, hey, if you can't put the Lord first, maybe you're not a disciple. See, one of the things that's great about our congregation, everybody's here Sunday. And when we have men's night out, all the brothers are here. Amen? And we have women's night out, all the sisters there. Because if you only had part of the sisters there, it just wouldn't be family. Are you with me right here? There's a power when everybody has a unified faith. We're calling all of our members to get ready starting now to be able to go to Portland for the World Missions Jubilee. Now, we realize some of the disciples may not have enough money. Amen. Some of the brothers and sisters are willing to help you on out to make sure you get on up there. But now is the time to plan. Can you imagine all of us going all the way on up to Portland? I mean, just the experience is incredible. Are you with me right here? And, you know, one of the things that was very interesting this past week, uh, uh, Jeff and Debbie came on over the house uh, Friday night when we just got back from Portland. And I said, you know, bro, you know, I think one of the things that, that you just got to challenge the church a lot more on is the contribution. Because we talked to, to one of the sisters, and she heard you say, yeah, we got to sacrifice, but if you can't do a tithe, just sacrifice. And she just felt like, well, sacrifice for me is only so much. I said, you know, bro, you got you to lay it out that tithing was the minimum of the Old Testament. You know, we've got to understand, if we're not giving to God, according to Malachi 3, our tithes and offerings, then we're robbing God, and we're not right with God. Are you with me right here, guys? Now, think about it. The power of God's church is when everybody has a unified faith. Now, let's face it. Look around the auditorium. We're a far cry from being all the same, if you know what I mean. I mean, we've got a huge age spectrum right here. We've got every shade of skin under the rainbow and then some. I mean, we've got different social economic levels, but, but yet we are all one in Christ, and the power of it is that our number one conviction is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors ourselves. When you're unified like that, nothing will stop you. And see, that is the promise that God gave Joshua and that God gave his people. And so was the conquest of Jericho. Thank you, and God bless.